everyone. Welcome to the Zest, the official podcast of Orange Coast Magazine. I'm Chelsea Ranieri, and today's guest is a celebrity stylist, brand strategist, and creative consultant who has worked with everyone from Kaya Gerber and Laura Harrier to Sophia Ritchie. Thank you so much for being here today, Carly Landig. Hi, Chelsea. It's so great to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. I'm so excited to get to talk with you like this because last year I got to talk with you for the magazine and I had so much fun getting to learn about what you do and your story. So I'm excited to share it with our listeners. Amazing. I'm honored to be here. Happy to share. Yeah. So the last time we spoke, you said that shoes was your first word, which I think is so cute. Um, Has fashion always been something that you're interested in? Yes. So yes, according to my mother, shoes were my first (laughs) word. And as she was pushing me in like the cart at the local grocery store, she claims that I would literally stare innocent passerbyers up and down as they passed, you know, trying to buy a box of cereal and critique their outfits as literally like a three-year-old. So it's something that's always been like a part of who I am. And I've always known that that's, you know, exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and here I am 15 years later, yeah. no, well, not 15 years later from the, from the grocery yeah, store, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 15 years into my career. And I've been um, working in fashion ever since. Amazing. So where did that come from when you were three? Was your mom really into fashion or? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, <laughs> I think it's a culmination of things. My dad, um, is very creative. He's been an artist, um, painter, play the guitar. Um, he's a business owner now. Um, so made that transition, but such a creative person. And my mom was creative in a different way. Like she was always doing like crafts around the house. This is the nineties guys. Yeah. (laughs) But just like, she wasn't doing a creative, she wasn't a creative field, but definitely a creative person. She would throw fabulous parties all the time for like our friends and family and just, um, knew how to make things beautiful from something really simple. And so I think it came from both my parents, but I don't know if you remember this, um, or any of our listeners do, but there used to be this is before streaming guys. This is like basic cable. Um, yeah, there was a yeah. channel called style.com and it launched through Vogue and they would, um, have basically runway on like 24 seven throughout the day. And as like a really little kid, I would sit there and like watch runway shows. And so I think it's like part nurture, part nature. Um, yeah. but that's been like fashion. I was in like my creative expression. Um, so yeah. That's so cool. I kind of do remember that website. Yeah. Well, it was, it's still, a, I don't know if it's a website anymore, but I don't think so. I think it's just bow.com now, but yeah, it was a, it was a, like a, a channel on TV. Yeah. Which is oh, so cool. channel. Yeah. yeah they yeah, need to bring yeah. that back. <laughs> right. I, I feel like they used to play that in boutiques in South Coast Plaza. Cause I remember yes. just like a constant stream of runway stuff. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, So you went to UC Irvine and you had so many different internships in the fashion industry, including one that you did in London. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? Oh, yeah. Um, First of all, thought, thought, loved my experience at UCI. Um, Yeah, definitely was interning every summer, started in high school and then interned um, each year. Um, My first internship was actually at Nordstrom and I was in high school. Um, I was on their fashion board. That's what they called it back then. I don't know if it still exists, <laughs> but it was such a cool experience. Um, we would like get to help put on fashion shows. We would sit in um, in like buyers meetings, um, oh, wow. friend reporting. Um, we they'd have like different leaders of the company come and do presentations for us. And so that was really my first taste into like corporate fashion. And I knew that I was like, I'm going to work here someday. Like this, it was such like a a life changing experience to be able to like have your eyes as a high schooler open to this like new world. Yeah. And I feel like you and I were chatting offline, but Orange County is not the fashion mecca. <laughs> <Yeah. You know? laughs> so finding those opportunities while living in Orange County felt like finding a gem. Um, and so that I feel like was probably one of my most transformative internships. I worked for a branding agency in London, going back to your question. Um, and that was right after I graduated college. I played soccer in college. So studying abroad wasn't like really feasible for me. And so Mm. I was like, I'm going to get an, like, I'm going abroad. I'm going to get that experience, but I want to do it where it's still pushing my career forward. Uh, If I'm being totally transparent, the internship itself like was not life-changing, but (laughs) working abroad was. Yeah. If our younger listeners um, have that opportunity, like, please do. Obviously living in London, that's not a huge culture shock. They speak English. Like, let's not act like (laughs) I'm in Paris. I'm not Emily in Paris, guys. Um, But... I, um, there's, it's still a different like 
work culture there. It and is. Just, like, I've been, and it's it, it's yes. different. Yeah. Yeah. And even just like navigating the city and like making yeah. new friends because I wasn't in like a structured study abroad program. So it's like I was like building a life there as like a whatever 21 year old. And so um such an amazing growth like growth uh, experience for me. Yeah. And then just so like subway on, navigating the subway alone or they call yes. it the tube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And like um each weekend like with my you know new friends that I'm making we'd like go jump to a new country over the weekend. And so just was like, it was such a adventure. And like I said, I got to have that experience, but still like got to put something on my resume, which is important at that yeah. stage of your career, you know? Totally. So you mentioned Nordstrom earlier and you ended up going on to work for them on the creative team. So can you talk a bit about how this role came about and what that entailed? Yeah. Okay. So, um, at the time I was at Nordstrom there, the company was broken out by region. Cause if you think about like the product mm-hmm. that you're buying in New York city, is going to feel different than like a season that's happening in Southern California. Right? right. And so, um, that's how the company was structured. So I was on the creative team for Southern California. So I was responsible for all their, uh, creative for that region. And it was our largest oh, wow. region. It was like a $1.4 billion business. Um, <laughs> and we did such some amazing stuff when I was there. So like, at that time is when Topshop was first brought to the U.S. So as a part of that transition, um, we opened up Madewell and Nordstrom stores during my time there. Um, Brandy Melville, <laughs> that was a big moment for her at Nordstrom stores. Yeah. Right there. Um, also, like opened the Grove in um, L.A., Delamo, which was a new store that opened when I was there. And then also like the $30 million, like big South Coast Plaza remodel, which I'm sure you're aware of. Oh, worked yeah. On that. So yeah, so uh, res- oh I'm kind of responsible for like pop and shops, event installations, new store openings, just like how our creative expressions came to life in Southern California, basically. I can like totally contextualize like what time in my life that was yeah. at. I remember <laughs> yeah. when Topshop came to Nordstrom, it was such a big deal. Yes, it was. And the product was so yeah. good. It I was, was so like, good. I was a Topshop girl back then. It's all I could Thank afford. You. And I yeah. was like, I was, I was in it. I was invested. <laughs> yeah. And you just come from London. So you got to experience that there. Yes. Then, okay. <laughs> yeah. What a great time. Yeah. You're, you're doing a great job podcast host. What a great time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you then went into working as the director of brand marketing at who, who, at where, like what a freaking dream. What were some of the things that you were doing at this position? Um, okay, so for my non-fashion folk, who what wear is <laughs> was like the first digitally native fashion editorial. So like think of <laughs> Vogue, um, but they're purely online. But within that kind of editorial media company, they had a consumer brands division. Um, and that's where I sat as the director of brand marketing. So it Got kind of it. acted like as a brand incubator. So we were like developing and launching brands with wholesale partners, I'm sorry, with retail partners. And so Mm -hmm. we um, started clothing lines in Nordstrom, in Target. There was some international expansion in Selfridges. Um, And then about in like the last like year and a half of my time, maybe two years there, we launched a direct-to-consumer line, um, which I oversaw, which was such a cool experience. I'm sure our listeners are all familiar with that big time of all these new D2C brands like Glossier and like... um, Yes. And outdoor voices. It was just that it was at that moment in, mm-hmm. in that, like everything was direct to consumer. And so I got to get, you know, experience in that side of the business, which again, very different than, for example, working for a, a big retailer like Nordstrom. So that was a great learning right. experience for me. That whole moment was so cool. I feel like it was like the girl boss era. Like there's all these amazing, like female owned companies. Um, so as you, I mentioned before, you got to work with some really great celebrities. Um, what are some of your favorite memories from working at Who What Where and working with with them? Yeah, so Who What Where was honestly such a great experience. Um, I feel like I'm sure you'll connect with this too, but one of my favorite parts of working in fashion are the people because your colleagues become like your closest friends. In yeah. reality, you're like spending more time with them than you are with your family, <laughs> and um, <laughs> there's just so much commonality i think when you're in a creative field because let's be real like it's notoriously underpaid it's super volatile and so like you're there because you're passionate about what you're doing and so mm-hmm. you have so much in common with your coworkers um you know we're all into you know what's going happening in like the cultural zeitgeist what's happening in fashion we're all predominantly women and so honestly yeah. like my favorite memories have just been like 
being with my people, being on set, developing brands, writing hilarious social copy, like <laughs> just like, you know, it's such a creative um, field and business. And so it's mm-hmm. like, I was going to work with my friends. And so I know yeah. that sounds really simple, but I think that like culture is so important. Who you work with is so important. And that had a really great positive impact on my experience in the workforce there. Um, so, but going back to your question about celebrities. So I worked closely and still do with um, the editorial director at Who Wear. Her name's Lauren Egerton. She's fabulous. And um, she has amazing taste. So we were pulling from these amazing houses like Prada, Mimi, Chanel, Saint Laurent. So just like to be uh-huh. around like and like style that level of product feels like a dream come true. Like, like I said, especially coming from like an Orange County girl. So um, yeah. that ha- I feel like those moments have been so cool. Like seeing the things that you see on the runway, like come to life in front of you um, has been a really beautiful and creative expression. Yeah. It's, were you styling the entire time at Who It Wear? Did you kind of transition into that? Okay. So... Styling, I know it sounds crazy, but like styling mm-hmm. and brand marketing kind of go uh-huh. hand in hand because when you're in brand marketing, anything that touches the consumer you oversee. So like when a consumer uh-huh. is seeing an image on your website or an image on social, um, that is a part of content that we're creating. So mm-hmm. I've always worked either closely with stylists or style, styled our own shoots ourselves, And so styling has always like been woven throughout my career. Um, but when I left to it where, and I went on my own, a large part of my business has been purely styling. And so now yeah. I've had this like full circle relationship with who it where, where now they're bringing me on, um, to help them with their projects. And that's when the, um, kind of how the celebrity styling has kind of started to come to life at who it where. Amazing. So yeah, as you mentioned, um, you went on your own in styling for, for styling in 2023. How did it feel to take that leap? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've always been really entrepreneurial. And like I said, I grew up with my dad starting his own business and I was really young. So I, I feel like my only exposure, I've like, I've only been exposed personally to what it's like to own your own business. So it's something that's always been in me. And I've always had some sort of side hustle for most of my career, like even when I was in corporate positions. So to be honest, it has felt like a really natural transition. And then, like I said, some of my old colleagues have become clients. And so it's been really like fun and full circle where I still feel like I um, get to work these really great teams that I I know personally. So the transition has not felt so stark, I think Mm -hmm. I would say. Um, I, I feel like we, ch- we touched on this in our interview, but um, my mom had battled cancer for most of my life and I was her caretaker um, for most of my 20s and I'm in my 30s now. And she unexpectedly passed away from cancer um, so sorry. a couple, oh, thank you, um, a couple years ago. And that kind of started my transition of going on my own. Um, just to be like totally honest, um, I feel like it... I needed to be my own boss to give myself the space and the time to grieve appropriately. Fashion is a grind. I was working like crazy hours. It just like wasn't sustainable with all my personal life changes. Um, Mm -hmm. And so like I wanted to find my own version of work-life balance. And for me, consulting felt like a a healthy way to achieve that. Um, And so that's kind of part of my why too, which is important. I think it also on a more like macro level to anyone who's listening, I was just like talking to somebody and um, like a mentor of mine and talking about like in our careers at different stages of our careers, we can only juggle a few balls and like, Mm. and what those priorities are. And so whether that's compensation, title, work-life balance, vacation days, flexibility, autonomy, um, yeah, you're so, so right. Those things matter at more. They rise to the top at different stages in our lives. And so at this stage of my life, I needed flexibility and autonomy. And so will I for will I always be a consultant? I don't know. I don't know but right but right now and over the past year and a half, it's what I've needed. Um and so I say that to anybody who's like thinking about a change or trying to figure out like what is their yeah. value. Um, is I think that's like has helped me kind of like frame these different stages of my career. 
Definitely. Well, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that story. I'm so sorry that happened, but um, oh, that's you. so true. Like, and thinking of like all of those different variables, uh, it almost reminds me of like the love languages. Like everyone, every single one matters, but certain ones matter more. Yeah, to you at that's such a good. I've never heard it cont- like said like that. That was such a good point. Um, but since going out on your own, you've had the opportunity to work on selling OC, which is so <laughs> cool. So tell me about that. Uh, yeah, I cannot help but laugh when people mention it because it was <laughs> so fun and hilarious and all the things that you would think it is, it is. Yeah. Um, and I worked with Gio and Tiffany um, who are married. Um, you said their first baby a little bit ago. Um, oh. And it was a wild ride. I worked with them on a couple of seasons, um, really rebranded Gio for his, like, uh, I think they went to Cabo or Cancun, that Mexico trip, I think. <laughs> I can't remember which season, but worked with him um, on some of his filming uh, days outside of that. And then worked with uh, Tiffany for a couple of seasons on the days that she was going to be, um, yeah, a part, a part of the film crew. And so I've never worked in TV before. So yeah. that was uh, so fun, such a great experience to be on set for some things and um, just kind of learn the POV of what they're looking for. Um, so, yeah crazy experience, but so fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I can't help laugh. It was, it was, it was very, no very fun. I've only seen selling sunset and the outfits are like a lot. Um, it's selling a see like how, or how did you approach what they were wearing for that show? Oh my gosh. That's such a great question. <laughs> I mean, obviously the culture of LA and Orange County are so different. So right. um, you're like, you don't, it's not that extreme. <laughs> and um, to be honest, like I have a very specific point of view. And so my clients, they hire me for that. So like, I was not yeah. trying to match the energy that was having on. <laughs> that's, that's, and, and no, no disrespect. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not my personal POV. Um, mm-hmm. So I was just trying to push Geo into like, what's relevant, what's happening, what are the trends, um, what trends hit on again for like vacation slash professional wear when he was in Mexico. I was just trying to have him feel like real, like a real person yeah. and coordinated. Um, that was my, my goal. Um, and so, no, it's, if you guys go back and watch and see the things that he's wearing, it's not going to feel <laughs> comparable to Selling Sunset. Yeah, right. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the different services that you offer. Yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a laundry list. You ready? <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah, the, the, your title, you have like three different um, titles that you're working with. So I'm excited to hear. Yeah. So I, I do a lot. Um, so like I said, backgrounds in brand marketing, that is anything from like, what's, what is the vision of the brand? What's the voice of the brand? Again, like any touch points that we talked about. So that could be social, digital strategy, experiential marketing, PR, influencer, et cetera. So that's my background. Mm-hmm. I still do that for brands. Um, but then I also do styling editorially and then with mm-hmm. celebrity styling. And then I also do styling for brands. Um, and then I also do like consulting for brands. So if they're looking to like rethink their product strategy, they want me to come in and do trend forecasting, work with them on like maybe a new concept they have for their line, or maybe they're trying to pivot kind of what their audience perception is. I'll come in and help them at different stages in the product process as well. Um, so kind of a broad umbrella, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I've done so many different things in the industry. And so I think I just kind of come with a very like holistic perspective of being able to view all sides of the industry from, like I said, like media and editorial to resale, retail, wholesale, direct to consumer. Um, and I worked in each stage of the product process. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of like I can, I can meet my clients where they need me. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, well, in terms of uh, styling, so you do personal and celebrity styling. How do you approach working with a new client? Maybe someone who like, in this hypothetical, someone who doesn't really know what their style is, but they want to kind of just like a refresh. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that, I feel like let's look at it. I think what's me most probably like um, relatable to your audience is probably talking about like personal styling because I feel like they can maybe like, take nuggets for themselves. Do you want to talk about that? Okay. Perfect. So I think like first and foremost is understanding what their needs are. So we'll walk through their current closet. We're going to see what they're hating, what they're loving. I get to see what they're naturally gravitating towards. And then also helps me start to see the holes in their wardrobe. 
Um, mm-hmm. I want to understand like what their biggest pain points are in getting dressed. Like some people hate getting dressed. They have no, they <laughs> don't know what to wear. And I want to help that be a pleasant, easy, seamless experience. And so really understanding like what is their lifestyle? We have this idea in our head of what we wear every day. And the reality mm-hmm. is like, where are you actually going? <laughs> and what are you physically putting on on a daily basis? Um, yeah. And so like having those real conversations of like, what is, what does it look like right now? Um, from then, we then start to redefine what their aesthetic is. And so what I found is, and this is like a common practice in styling, but like defining your style in three adjectives. So what's realistic? So like, what are you naturally gravitating towards? What do you wear all the time? Um, it doesn't even be your favorite things. It's like, what are you just, what are you just instinctively reaching towards? So that's realistic. No. Second one is aspirational. So like what's in your saved folder on Instagram or Pinterest or a mood board, if you're one of those types, um, <laughs> kind of w- what's your North star? Like if you could dress any way, like where would you want to go? Uh, and then the last one is emotional. So getting dressed actually is the most thing. What you're saying is this is how I want to feel when I put this on. And mm-hmm. so how do you want to feel in your clothes? And so when we start defining those things, they kind of come together and they lead us in a direction. And then it also becomes a really great frame of reference for my clients because when they get dressed in the morning, they say, I want to feel this, this, and this. So for example, for me, I define mm-hmm. my style as minimal. I just want it to be like simple that's yeah. what I'm gravitating. I'm grabbing towards like an oversized blazer, a great pair of denim, and a great pair of shoes. Like I want to be simple and minimal, but I want it to feel really elevated. So elevated is not yeah. And then my last word is effortless. I want to look like I didn't try, but I somehow miraculously put this amazing look together. And so yeah. how these three words come together kind of help this define um, my client's style. Okay, so that's words, right? But we need pictures. Huh. So the next step is I put together literally like this massive mood board of inspiration images that we have to align on. So they can go through and be like, yes, yes, no, no. And we have this like really amazing kind of like booklet that is our guide into like when, before I start sourcing. So we have like, like I said, like six pages of like inspiration (sighs) images that we're like, this is where we're going. And then we have a visual alignment. So then when I, where I'm taking them, they feel good about, and they have a visual representation of what that looks like. It also serves my clients because then they have all these amazing outfits that they know how to put together because I've created this mood board too, right? Right, yeah. So that be, kind of becomes our guide. And then I start sourcing, we do fittings and you know that's just the beginning of it. Um, mm-hmm. And then depending on how much help my clients need, I do like complete outfit builds well, like in their mood board. So they literally, if they want, they can open up my deck each morning and just pick out an outfit. Like depending on like how seamless they want this Oh my to God, be. the dream. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. So it's so it's super fun. It's hands-on. I like love getting to know my clients and like I said, like meeting them where they are. Um, but that's kind of like an overview, I think, of like what the yeah. the the process is. It sounds so fun and exciting. Um, well, we're going into fall. Uh, and so or actually we're in fall, but with every different season, I always feel like I need to grab a new trend or like my wardrobe never feels like enough every single time I change seasons. So how do you approach um, going into a new season? And also, can you talk a little bit about trends and how you also approach that too? Yes, absolutely. So my fashion point of view is quality Mm. over quantity. So I so believe in like the capsule wardrobe. So basically where you have all these like building blocks of this great wardrobe in these high quality materials, high quality craftsmanship. Um, and they all come together because they all work together. And so Mm -hmm. getting dressed feels really easy. Um, and so like key things in a capsule wardrobe would be like a great blazer, a great leather jacket, a great relaxed pair of denim, a pair of trousers, amazing layering pieces, like a crisp white button up, a cashmere sweater, like these simple things, but that all come together and feel really like chic, elevated, timeless. And then from there, once you have all of those building blocks, then you start injecting trends each season. So if you already have all the bases, covered, oh. and again, they're high quality, they're draping beautifully, they fit, they're tailored to perfection. Like those were intentional choices. Then we can make intentional trend choices to create these really new and fresh outfits. So that's kind of like my macro 
VA1 fashion. And then yeah. we go down to like each season. So for example, like fall for the season, fall 2024, mm-hmm. Suede is having like a huge moment. Yes. And it, yes. And love like, so it. You're, and you're already kneeling it. You're in that espresso brown color right now. Oh, so thank for you. Listeners, <laughs> yeah. Like that espresso chocolatey brown is like, I mean, it's like it's hot. It's continued to have a moment, but it's like it's definitely having a moment right now. Like yeah. the it piece that like I need this fall is like a suede kind of oversized blazer. Um, See, oh my god, specifically brown. I yeah, I don't know how to buy them. They're so cute. <laughs> okay, but you have to get on it. I was like sourcing them for a shoot <laughs> okay. last week, and they're already starting to sell out. So people <laughs> buy your suede blazer. They're already yeah. going fast. <laughs> it's only October. Um, yeah. Another great, I think, trend in terms of because, like, my thing fall. I think of like outerwear. I think of shoes. Um, but so another great outer piece is like an oversized bomber jacket and yeah, leather. Yeah. Um, again, like I'm gravitating towards this kind of like worn in brown color. Um, mm-hmm. Burgundy is like the color of the season, but I'm going to be real with you. I just can't get behind it. I went hard in oxblood like <laughs> 10 years ago and I just, I can't. <laughs> oh my God. It. I know exactly the era you're talking about. Yes. Yep, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I'm not ready for it yet, but maybe yeah. for my younger or older girls who didn't go hard into oxblood, they're ready for that. <laughs> In terms of like other kind of head to toe. So when I say color, I'm talking about like monochrome looks like head to toe. Like yeah. red was really big, but it's still here. I'm still committed to it. I love it. Um, mm-hmm. Chocolate, like I said, is huge. And then like, I'm still into that like butter yellow color. And I feel like red yes, and do. that butter yellow like pair so beautifully back to brown. And those combinations like feel really fresh and new. Um Girl, I could go on for days for trends. You just tell me when okay, it's Okay, but I have like a <laughs> random specific question, but you're talking about chocolate colors and I always have, I don't know if anybody else has this problem, but I always have a problem with styling. Like if I'm wearing a black jacket with brown shoes or vice versa, I'm like, does it look weird or is it okay? Or how do you feel about mixing those? Oh my gosh, it's such a good question. Um, <laughs> I wish I, like, it, I think it's harder to answer verbally. Like I wish I could give you in it, like images. Yeah, for right. It. But um, Black and brown definitely work together, but it should be intentional. So like if you have, if you're wearing brown shoes and a black leather jacket and then like a white shirt, like how yeah. are we making these connect? So it's like, if I, right. if, if I was going to put that outfit together, then I would do like, maybe like that brunch, like you're in a brown sweater. If you want to do like a uh-huh. brown jacket over it, I mean, a black jacket over it. Great. But then that brown shoe helps connect to that brown shirt. Or like maybe you're in like, a long maxi like silk brown dress like throw that on with like a black leather jacket or black blazer but then make that make sense with the black shoe so it's kind of like connecting the dots so it feels intentional um yeah. and, like i think like grounding the look in it so it's like if you're in a black blazer but a brown outfit probably do a black shoe i feel like that's gonna yeah. help ground the look and then let's say that you are in a brown blazer and a black shoe well then maybe the dress is brown so it's brown brown then a black shoe does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. Again, it's like all it's like you need act. a visual expression of what I'm saying, but maybe the, maybe no. that's looking. Oh, Anybody I'm, can DM me. I'll send you. I'll send you images if you have questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so technical. It's so much more technical than just like putting together an outfit. And I feel like that's maybe what people miss when they're trying when they're struggling to get dressed. It's so it's so technical. I know it's the details, and that's what's yeah. hard. I know. I know. I think that like my advice to people is obviously hire a stylist. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. But also like, I think that like with like TikTok and like social and whatever, like you can find these really great inspiration images and just honestly copy them. Like there's nothing yeah. new under the sun, like, and have no shame in that. And so like, when you have a question, go find an image that helps answer it. Like, and I think that helps make it, make it make more sense. Totally. Yeah. Pinterest is like my lifeline when I can't figure it out. Um, so what, so you talked a little bit about, um, holes in closets, holes in wardrobes when you were helping with working with a client, what are some common holes that you see? People. Okay. Denim is so clutch. And I feel like Mm -hmm. not everybody has embraced the like oversized denim trend. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, Denim is so key of having the right denim. And so in taking care of your denim, I cannot tell you my, cl- like my clients, everyone listening, do not dry your denim. Honestly, I know literally don't do be, it. <laughs> be Michael Scott from the office and like dry clean your denim, like take care of your clothes. Like you, your wardrobe will literally improve like 25% if you just don't have any wrinkles 
And if it's like steamed, right? Like iron steam, wrinkle free, and no pills. Like you yeah. are yourself to like take care of your stuff. Um, but I think that like if you are still wearing skinny jeans, it's mm-hmm. time to move on. And <laughs> honestly, there's a new it's not new, it's been it's it's been around, but I think that it's like, you know, picking up steam, I guess, is kind of mm-hmm. that um gosh, what is it called? Like the horse. Oh my gosh. Now, of course I'm forgetting the name, but it's like the, um, a bear, thank you. Barrel oh. Lake, the Barrel Lake. Yes. Denim. I know exactly and what you're talking super about. Super flattering because it's not going to be the baggy denim that like puddles at your feet. The worry about stepping on your, like on your denim and having like it start fraying and getting dirty or whatever. Like right. if you have not, if you not fully embrace oversized denim, try Barrel Lake. You'll look like a million bucks and you'll look new and fresh i feel like if your denim is not updated the rest of your outfit it, it's it, it's done like there's no hope for it <laughs> yeah that's a good tip um well i did want to touch on you recently started business school which i've always like it's always in the back of my mind of going back to school and then there's always just like all these barriers but like can you share a bit about what inspired you to go back oh my gosh yes okay so i work with a lot of um, CMOs, chief market marketing officers. Mm-hmm. And kind of when you look at the job description of a CMO, it's starting to read more and more like a CEO in our industry because there's so much that makes a brand go around. Supply chain, sustainability, um, price structures. Um, and I feel like I needed to get a more well-rounded like business education because so much of my background is on the creative side. And I want to continue moving into more and more leadership positions. Um, and I, and then as a business owner, and obviously being in you know in directors' positions, like it has ignited this um, desire for like broader business acumen and and um, yeah. So I think it's like a culmination of me being an entrepreneur now, being in leadership positions now, and wanting to continue moving um, in that direction um, yeah. has kind of like led. That was kind of the catalyst of, um, going to school. So I'm in an executive program. So I'm still working full time. And then my cohort is full of all these other people who are in that kind of like 15, 20 year industry mark. So I get to learn from my peers. We're all still working, learn from people from other industries. Um, right now though, I'm in finance. I'm in statistics. I'm in financial accounting for decision makers. And so it is, um, it has been a lot of work, but I really believe in the power of continuous learning. And so mm-hmm. it's been a really exciting uh, next chapter for me. Yeah, well, good for you. That's amazing. Um, well, is there anything that we can keep an eye out coming up in your career? And also if you can shout out where people can hire you for personal styling, because I feel like people want to know this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So reach out to me for any of your marketing needs. Reach out to me for styling. My website is carlylanding.com, easy. And then on Instagram, mm-hmm. I'm Carly Jane Landig. Um, but yes, please hit me up. I'm always here for <laughs> styling, t- styling tips, suggestions. I got your back. So yeah. Perfect. Well, before I let you go, I have three final questions for you that we call the thoughtful three. So first, if you could go back to the beginning of your career and give yourself advice, what would you say? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I'm so passionate <laughs> about people who are trying to navigate what's next in their career. <laughs> um, I think, like I said before about like my decision to go back to school, go to USC is embrace continuous learning, like always be a knowledge seeker, whether that's through formal education, reading, mentorship, um, like prioritize that, like, you know, personal development, um, your net, your network is everything. Relationships are crucial. Mm -hmm. Um, find mentors, build your personal board of directors, spend time developing and nurturing that network. Like, that is the most valuable way you can spend your time at work is that. Um, yeah. Board of directors, I, I love. Yes, totally. Um, and I think like take risks, like don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. Life is long. Um, and our, that's our intuition telling us if it's time to make a change and listen to that. Obviously, like listen, get advice. Don't make <laughs> rash decisions without, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not encouraging that, but I think that um, risks taking risks and being willing to take leaps and changes your career, um, is important and to not stay in our comfort zones. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think, I think I hit on this earlier of like, respect your work-life balance, prioritize your, prioritize yourself, be an advocate for yourself. Um, 
because you're responsible for you and no one else is going to be responsible for you, especially in the workforce. Um, and I think just be resilient. Careers are full of changes. Um, and just know that cultivating resilience and a positive mindset, like that is going to separate you from others. Um, I think those are a couple. Yeah, definitely. Those are all great too. Um, how do you approach risk now versus when you did when you were first starting out? Cause you've taken risks and they've worked out really well for you, but, um, yeah, how do you approach it differently? Gosh, I think when I was younger, I was so afraid. I always, I always had these mm-hmm. big dreams and goals for myself, but even though I had the, like these big goals and dreams, they actually made me feel like I'm behind. Like, how am I going to get there? Yes. Like, oh my God, late, that's so relatable. Yeah, like a day late, dollar short. Like, wait, like, and there's no roadmap. Like even people who think that they have it figured out, like they don't. We are all <laughs> just trying to figure it out. Um, and so it's like, be kind to yourself in that. Um, but also like, take the risk. Like, don't be afraid. Like, again, like I said, wise counsel, take time to reflect. Don't make decisions yeah. for having a good night's sleep. Like I like, that's not what I'm saying. But I think that like at any stage, I don't care if you're having a midlife crisis, like take the risk, like make a change. Like change is what has how we grow when we're comfortable, when we're doing the same thing day in and day out. We're not growing, we're not expanding. Um, my kind mm-hmm. of personal mindset is like, if I'm not doing something that challenges me every day, like I'm being stagnant. And so I like, I want to encourage anyone listening. um, Yeah. Try to do the same. I love that. Uh, And lastly, what advice would you give to someone who finds themselves outside of their comfort zone? I feel like you've already answered this. (laughs) I said, say, keep going. I know it's Mm -hmm. so uncomfortable. Like I feel you like (laughs) going, Um, but in the midst of the discomfort, get support. So like Mm -hmm. I said, like have mentors that you're leaning into, build your personal board of directors. Um, Don't be afraid to ask questions um, and lean into what's new. So if that means, oh man, I need more education on this. I need more support. That's okay. Ask for help, take classes. Um, But because no one achieves anything alone. But I think the fact that you're out of your comfort zone means that you're on a really good path, a good path of growth and change. And so keep going. I love that. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Carly. I learned so much and I'm so excited to go up and stairs my closet and reorganize now. So (laughs) I appreciate you doing this. Of course. It was so fun chatting. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks.